Hello, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense. This is the seventh video on biochemistry questions and answers. In this biochemistry playlist, you learn about everything from DNA, RNA, titration of amino acids, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, cell membrane, cell signaling, and all of the metabolic pathways. Please try to watch these videos in order. Now let's get started. Please bring a pen and paper and let's see how many of these questions you'll answer correctly. Click the like button, click the subscribe button and let's get started. There is also another playlist on my channel titled MCAT questions where you will find chemistry questions, biology questions, biochemistry questions and soon we'll add organic chemistry and physics questions. Question 40, because the previous 39 are in previous videos. In which of the following sites do prenylation, phosphorylation, and carboxylation of proteins take place? Is it the nucleus, the cytoplasm, the peroxisome, the interstitial fluid, or the plasma? Please pause and try to answer this yourself. First, let's draw a cell. Here is a cell. This is my nucleus right here. Outside the nucleus, there is the cytoplasm. The peroxisome is an organelle in the cell. Outside the cell, there is the extracellular fluid, because inside the cell, we have the intracellular fluid. This extracellular fluid is divided into two parts. Whatever is in the bloodstream or in the blood vessel is called the plasma or the serum. Outside it, there is the interstitial fluid, which is also known as ISF, interstitial fluid. Now, at which site do these processes take place? I hope you recognize that prenylation, phosphorylation, carboxylation, hydroxylation, glycosylation, all of these are examples of what? Post-translational modification of proteins, which take place once the proteins have left the nucleus and went to the cytoplasm via the nuclear pores. Because it's all about the central dogma. When you replicate DNA, it's called DNA replication, which is just making a copy of DNA. From DNA to RNA, it's called transcription. In the beginning, it's called hnRNA. Heterogeneous nuclear in the nucleus, RNA. Okie dokie, let's make it pure instead of heterogeneous. Let's modify it in post-transcription modification. Post-transcription means after transcription modification from hnRNA into mRNA. The post-transcription modification includes splicing of the introns. These are the bad guys. These are the intervening particles. Throw them into the trash and then add a cap at the five prime end and a tail at the three prime end. Can someone tell me what was the name of the cap and what was the name of the tail? Comment below. Next, the mRNA will leave the nucleus because all of this happened in the nucleus and will go to the cytoplasm through the nuclear pores. From the nucleus to the cytoplasm, just like that. From the nucleus to the cytoplasm via the nuclear pores. Outside the nucleus, i.e. in the cytoplasm, translation or protein synthesis takes place. But these proteins are not ready yet to function. We need to modify them. This is called post-translational modification, not to be confused with post-transcriptional modification. After transcription, you get post-transcriptional. After translation, you get post-translational modification of proteins, which include prenylation, phosphorylation, carboxylation, glycosylation, or hydroxylation. Prenylation means adding lipids. Phosphorylation means, guess what? Adding phosphate. Carboxylation, adding carboxyl group, or COO, i.e. CO2. Glycosylation, make it sweet by adding oligosaccharides. Hydroxylation, meaning adding hydroxyl groups to proteins. Glycosylation and hydroxylation happen to collagen, if you remember the story. In fact, if I suffer from scurvy, vitamin C deficiency, I'll be unable to hydroxylate my collagen. That's why I have weak blood vessels, weak connective tissue, etc. That's why I have bleeding gums, because my collagen is not hydroxylated, is not properly modified, because I need vitamin C for the hydroxylation process of proteins. So all of these post-translational modifications, processes of proteins take place in the cytoplasm. That was the first question. If you want to see more questions like these in the future, drop a question mark emoji in the comments. 
Next, what is the rate limiting enzyme in the de novo purine synthesis pathway? Is it A, CPS1, or B, CPS2, or C, glutamine phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate amidotransferase, God bless it, HMG CoA synthase, or HMG CoA reductase? Which one? Please pause. The answer is, for de novo purine synthesis, you go with C, which is PRPP, phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate, amidotransferase. Let's review the incorrect choices. Carbamol phosphate synthetase 1 is the rate limiting enzyme in the urea cycle. How about carbamol phosphate synthetase 2? That's the rate limiting enzyme in the de novo pyrimidine synthesis, not purine. C, PRPP amidotransferase, that's the rate limiting step in purine synthesis. HMG-CoA synthase is the rate limiting step in ketogenesis and HMG-CoA reductase is the rate limiting step in cholesterol synthesis, de novo, by your liver's hepatocytes. We talked about most of these in my metabolism videos in this biochemistry playlist. Question 42. An experimenter observed that the cell stopped its glycogenesis pathway during the fasting state. Which of the following most likely inhibited the rate-limiting enzyme in that biochemical pathway? Was it insulin? Was it glucose 6-phosphate, cortisol, or glucagon? Please pause. Let's think about that. What does glycogenesis mean? Genesis means formation or creation. Glycogen is glycogen. It's a big sugar. So is this a process of building up or breaking down? Well, we're building up big stuff, big sugar. So we're converting small sugar, glucose, into big sugar, glycogen. Would you do this? Would you build up in the land of abundance or in the land of scarcity? Of course, I should build up in the land of abundance when I'm in the feeding state. But if I am in the fasting state, it makes sense to inhibit the process of abundance, to inhibit building up. Because if I'm fasting, I need energy. I'm starving. I need to do the opposite. I need to break down my glycogen into glucose. So I need to boost glycogenolysis and inhibit glycogenesis. And who is the hero of the fasting state, please? Answer, glucagon. So glucagon will stimulate the breakdown of glycogen into glucose while inhibiting the formation of glycogen from glucose. That's why glucagon is the correct answer. Let's try the other ones. Insulin, that's the land of abundance, the feeding state. Insulin is pro-glycogenesis. Insulin stimulates glycogen formation from glucose because insulin feeds the cell. Feeds them what? Glucose. And tells those cells, hey, if you want glucose right now, utilize it in glycolysis. If you do not want it right now, store it for a rainy day in the form of glycogen. So insulin stimulates glycogenesis. How about glucose 6-phosphate? Also stimulates glycogenesis because glucose 6-phosphate came from glucose. When I go from glucose to something bigger, glucose 6-phosphate, this will take me in the path of making glycogen. I am on the road. I'm getting there. Cortisol. Now, cortisol is important here because cortisol belongs to the glucagon land. But here is an exception because cortisol actually stimulates glycogenesis. Remember, we divided metabolism into two big worlds, the insulin world and the glucagon world. Insulin world in the feeding state, glucagon in the fasting state. In the insulin land, I want to build up big proteins from amino acids, big glycogen from glucose, big triglycerides from small free fatty acids. Conversely, in the fasting state or the starving state, I want to tear down Big proteins into small amino acids, big glycogen into small glucose, and big triglycerides into free fatty acids. So if you want to build up glycogen, glycogenesis, talk to insulin because insulin is your man. But if you want to break down glycogen, glycogenolysis, then glucagon is your guy. What is the rate limiting enzyme in glycogen synthesis or glycogenesis? Answer, glycogen synthase. Insulin is your man. What is the rate limiting enzyme in glycogen breakdown, i.e. glycogenolysis? Glycogen phosphorylase, glucagon, is your guy. Insulin came from the beta cell of the additive longer horns of the pancreas and insulin is pro-glycogen synthesis. Insulin stimulates the formation of glycogen 
from glucose. Glucagon does the opposite, and glucagon comes from the alpha cell. Glucagon inhibited glycogenolysis, which is the answer to the question. Let's review glycogen metabolism. Here is glycogen, here is glucose. If I am fed, if I want to store glycogen for a rainy day, then I go this way, from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, then the glucose 1-phosphate, then UDP glucose, then glycogen. This is anabolic during the feeding state, insulin land. That's why the key enzyme is stimulated by insulin as well as glucose 6-phosphate, as well as cortisol, and inhibited by the other guys, the fasting guys, glucagon and epinephrine. If insulin is going to stimulate glycogen synthase, then it makes sense that insulin will inhibit the opposite, glycogen phosphorylase. If glucagon inhibited glycogen synthase, then glucagon will stimulate glycogen phosphorylase. Insulin stimulates glycogen synthesis and inhibits glycogenolysis. Conversely, glucagon stimulates glycogenolysis while inhibiting glycogenesis. As for cortisol, remember, cortisol breaks down your muscles, that's why patients with Cushing syndrome suffer from thin extremities, because the muscles are breaking down from proteins into amino acids. Next, by gluconeogenesis, the amino acids will become glucose, and cortisol approves this message. And now when you have glucose, guess what? Glucose will become glycogen, and cortisol also stimulates this process. So, glycogen synthesis is favored by cortisol, i.e. cortisol is pro-glycogenesis. Who is pro-glycogenolysis? Epinephrine and glucagon. Now it all makes sense. I mean, look at these lovely medicosis illustrations. You can download them on my website, by the way. It's medicosisperfectionaries.com. So insulin stimulates glycogenesis, that's why it's not the answer. How about glucose 6-phosphate stimulates glycogen formation? Cortisol stimulates glycogen formation. The only one that inhibits it is glucagon. Next, a baby was born unto our world. Congratulations. Once breastfed, she started suffering from nausea and vomiting. Later, she developed cataracts in both eyes lenses as well as hepatomegaly, megaly means large, hepato means liver, big liver, and gram-negative bacterial sepsis. The question is, which of the following enzymes, A, B, C, or D, is most likely to be deficient in this baby? Please pause. Let's talk about that. Which enzyme is depicted by A? Well, it's the one that breaks down lactose into glucose and galactose. So this has to be lactase enzyme, which is deficient in lactose intolerance. How about enzyme B? It converts galactose into galactose 1-phosphate. Oh, it adds a phosphate. Has to be a kinase. Perfect. It's galactokinase. Excellent. How about C? It converts galactose 1-phosphate into glucose 1-phosphate. Oh, it's a uridyl transferase. So we call it galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase. Enzyme B, galactokinase, is deficient in a disease known as mild galactosemia, aka galactokinase deficiency. Enzyme C, galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase, is deficient in a disease known as severe galactosemia or classic galactosemia. Now, do you think these symptoms belong to the mild form of the disease or the severe form of this galactosemia? Of course, the severe form, making C the correct answer. How about D? Well, it's the enzyme that converts glucose 6-phosphate into glucose. Oh, so it took a phosphate out. It's going to be a phosphatase. And since it took out the phosphate at carbon number 6, we'll call it glucose 6-phosphatase, which is deficient in von Gerke's disease. But von Gerke's disease does not have cataracts. Von Gerke has hepatomegaly. Von Gerke has fasting hypoglycemia. Von Gerke is not brought about by breastfeeding. The one that's brought about by breastfeeding and cause all of these severe symptoms is galactosemia. I have a special video on galactosemia in my other biochemistry playlist. 
So, deficiency of lactase is seen in lactose intolerance. Deficiency of galactokinase is seen in mild galactosemia, less severe symptoms. Deficiency of galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase is the severe or classic galactosemia. Why is this more severe? I've talked about it in my previous video. Basically, because here I have accumulation of galactose 1-phosphate. And remember the rule. When you phosphorylate something, you fix that thing. Phosphorylation fixes stuff. Which means galactose 1-phosphate is trapped in the cell and cannot leave. Oh, it's trapped in my liver. I get hepatomegaly. It's trapped in my brain. I get intellectual disability. It's trapped in my lens. I get cataracts in both eyes. What's that? That's a sugar. That's a sugar. That's a sugar. When all of these accumulate, guess who's gonna love you? Bacteria. Especially the bacteria that are capable of metabolizing lactose, i.e. the lactose fermenters, such as the infamous Escherichia coli. And that's the cause of sepsis in these neonates. And that's why galactosemia is probably the only neonatal contraindication to breastfeeding. Because most babies should breastfeed, absolutely. But in some cases, breastfeeding might do more harm than good. Most of these cases are due to maternal issues. Mommy has issues. However, there is one case where it's the problem in the newborn. And this one case is galactosemia. Because if I get the breast milk, it has lactose, milk, sugar. Before you know it, it becomes galactose, galactose 1-phosphate. But since I lack this enzyme, this will be trapped in my cells, in my liver, in my brain, in my lens. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. If you found my videos to be helpful, please consider supporting the channel by buying me a coffee. You can download my biochemistry notes, my chemistry notes, my biology notes, physiology notes, all kinds of notes at medicosisperfectsnetics.com. I have premium courses on my website, such as my famous renal physiology course, which will teach you about glomerular filtration rate, plasma clearance, titration of acids, or titratable acidity in the late distal and collecting ducts. You will learn about the different mechanisms that take place in the proximal tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal tubules, etc. You can download this course today at medicosisperfectionaries.com. There are more than 600 premium videos available on this channel when you click the join button and choose the highest tier. These videos are for members only. Subscribe, hit the bell, smash like, support my channel on Patreon, PayPal or Venmo. Go to my website to download my courses, notes and cases or if you would like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionatus where medicine makes perfect sense.